if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. Good evening, I'm Melissa Davis, Director of Library and Archives here at the George C. Marshall Foundation. And I have with me tonight three very interesting women who recently completed working on the PBS American Experience show, The Codebreaker, about Elizabeth Smith Friedman. And we are very lucky to have them here with us this evening to talk with them about the making of the show and what they learned about Elizabeth and to share some experiences and some insight. I would like to introduce you to these three women. The first is Shana Gazit. She is an award-winning documentary producer, director, and writer. Her films have been honored with multiple Emmy nominations and three Emmy awards. Her work has also been recognized by the Alfred DuPont Columbia Journalism Awards, Peabody Awards, Writers Guild Awards, and the Sundance Film Festival. Some of her career highlights include two public television series and seven films for the history series, American Experience. Her work has also been featured in major standalone series, including Healing and the Mind with Bill Moyers, Slavery and the Making of America, Destination America, and This Emotional Life. In 2019, she completed an expose on the impact of captivity on the killer whales at SeaWorld. So welcome, Shauna. Great to be here. Hilary Klotz Steinman is an Emmy award-winning documentary film producer with over 20 years experience producing investigative, verite, and historical documentary films. This is Hilary's third time collaborating with Shauna Gazid for American Experience. Hillary and Shauna won an Emmy Award for co-producing The Pill about the history and impact of birth control for the American experience. Hillary received the Christopher Award and an Emmy Award nom Emmy nomination for the PBS series Slavery in the Making of America and an Emmy nomination for her research on the Bill Moyers PBS series Becoming American the Chinese Experience. Hillary's work has been featured on NBC, MSNBC, CNBC, Al Jazeera and at the New York Historical Society. So welcome, Hillary. Thank you for inviting me to be here. And finally, but not least, Sarah Keeling um, is a documentary filmmaker and associate producer. She co-directed the 2018 award-winning documentary short Into My Life for PBS POV series, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and Hot Docs International Film Festival and was awarded Best Documentary Short by the Real Sisters at the Diaspora Film Festival in New York. Sarah has been selected for fellowships at Made in, Made in New York Media Center, IFP Screen Forward Lab, and Union Docs Collaborative Studio Fellowship. Her credits include associate producer on the HBO feature documentary Baby Doc and Ballerina Boys for PBS American Masters, which was also directed by Shauna. So I welcome all three of you here tonight. Uh, rather than being a legacy lecture where everyone presents, we are going to be doing more of a question answer discussion uh, this evening. Uh, and we thought that that would be interesting, an interesting way to find out um, more about the process of making a documentary film. So let's start with that. Um, what was it like to make a documentary film during a pandemic? Um, Sarah, maybe you want to start with that one. How is it different making one normally and then also during a pandemic? Sure. Um, I'm also going to bounce that to uh, Shauna and Hillary. But I would say when we, when Shauna and Hillary invited me to join them on the project, we of course had no idea that there would be a pandemic. So the initial plans when I joined on were all for kind of the, I think, the normal modes of production that we were used to. And um, we were, um, we had a location ready, we were about to start filming. And that's when the news broke and um, things were shutting down. And we decided that it, it wasn't safe to proceed with the shoot as we had planned. So we, we put that on pause and um, took a moment to regroup and reconsider. And so everything really um, went remote and took a little bit of figuring out how to do that. Um, uh, I could speak a little bit, I guess, part of the research, um, which you had helped me with a lot, Melissa, um, 
uh, was we found a way to um, work remotely and um, send media and be able to access the wonderful archives um, at the George C. Marshall Foundation, which um, houses Elizabeth and William Friedman's archive and which we relied on heavily for the film. Um, it, it really makes up the body um, of the, the visual aspect and also a lot of the uh, research material that we needed. Um, and as far as filming for um, the interviews, we it was the first thing was safety. We wanted to make sure um, all the interview subjects and our crew, everyone was safe. Um, and so we we worked with our um, our team, our cinematographer and uh, the assistant camera and came up with a way to um, do the interviews remotely. So we were all on Zoom, Hillary, Shauna and myself. Um, Hillary and Shauna would be asking questions. We would kind of be running everything that we would usually do in person remotely and we, um, uh, devised a way uh, to stream the interviews and it involved some more monitors and trying to make it so that interview subjects could see Shauna and we had eye contact and kind of have that liveliness in the interviews but it took a little it took a little figuring out but we were uh, I think really fortunate with um, the crew we were working with that had the knowledge and the technical aspects and um, people were very willing to share uh, I guess experiences they had in the past with using some of this technology and so um, that really made it possible. But yeah, Hillary and Sean, I'm sure you have answers to that as well. I keep saying that this film was really the little engine that could because, it, you know, they were, there were moments, um, you know, I made the mistake of saying at some point in early March, we had all the shoots like just completely set up and um, in such great shape. And I made the mistake of saying this was the most perfect production <laughs> schedule that I had ever, ever been involved with. And then, you know, bang, in the middle of March, we had to just shut everything down. And, and we just really had no idea whether we'd be able to go forward with the film or not. Uh, it, it really, um, it was really touch and go. And, and um, there, there were really times where I thought, well, that's it, this film is not going to happen. But then we kind of um, saw a window in June, you know, where, I don't know, just like the three of us came together and we, <laughs> and we kind of went on a gut and said, okay, let's just, let's just go for it. And um, it, actually, you know, what really made it possible at the time was that my uh, first exposure to, um, to someone who, you know, got the virus was actually a cin cinematographer. Uh, and which she got quite ill in April, but she then recovered and she bounced back beautifully and turned around to us and said, I am willing to travel. Um, so that's how in the combination of Claudia recovering, us just having a gut instinct about June and we just went for it and did all the interviews. Uh, and that was the key. If we couldn't do the interviews, we didn't have a film. So, um, and, and we have stories to tell about <laughs> shooting in a <laughs> pandemic, which, which uh, Hillary can talk about, but um, it really, this really was a film that just wanted to be made, you know, against all obstacles, it wanted to be made. Yeah, and I was just going to jump in and add that, you know, a big component of this film is it's a historical documentary. So a huge component are the interviews. We can't make the film without the interviews. And we had all these people lined up to come to us in New York and, and to a, a central location. Um, uh, in Pennsylvania. And we, we typically do them all in a condensed period of days for, you know, as you know, documentaries are not big budget affairs. So you, they have to be done efficiently. And when the world shut down, the film is based on um, a fabulous book by Jason Fogoni, the woman who smashed codes. He lives in San Francisco. He has a, you know, a child and a wife. Can he travel? Can he participate or not? So Apart from our usual conversations about scheduling and dates and, you know, content, 
usually people are so busy. It's what date could you possibly come that might possibly work with our schedule? Instead, these were sort of more life and death considerations. How would you feel about participating? Who is in your family? Who do you live with? What kind of exposure or risks can you tolerate? What is too much? What is too little? And so we had to spend a lot of time in the spring just having conversations with people about their comfort level. And some of the people that we planned to interview really had to make the choice that there was no possible scenario where they could be comfortable. And these were people that we were excited to film who were gonna contribute so much. So we had to make a decision. Can we move forward with the number of people who can participate? And that was a little bit of a, of a leap of faith. Will we have enough material to make the film? So that was a really big one. But we were still, we're still sad to this date about the interviews we weren't able to do because they would have just further enriched the film. But we're really lucky that there were enough people that we could have a core of you know, phenomenally articulate, you know, smart uh, people who know the subject back and forth. So we got, we got very lucky that there were some intrepid in, individuals who were able to participate. And then the second thing was we had to face this decision, do we do this low budget style, send a camera directly into people's homes, do it yourself, they set up the light, they set up the camera so it's bare bones basic, we're talking simpler than local TV news because that was the safest. But that's gonna, needs a tag that says made during COVID anytime you see the footage, it's not gonna look good. And so, you know, Shauna was brave enough to say, okay, we want, this is a timeless subject. This is a film that could be watched in five years, in 10 years at universities, you know, high schools, middle schools, all sorts of organizations, libraries are gonna care about this subject for so many reasons. And so let's try to make this timeless. So that's when Claudia came in and we were really able to do something with the really, what we consider to be a really good production value that you wouldn't know it was shot during COVID. And it has a cohesive look and feel because as important as the visuals and what our interviewees are saying, the, the, the world in which they're filmed in impacts the whole feel of the film. So we got really lucky that we were able to work with Claudia and she was able to, to do that for us as the cinematographer, but also that our interviewees were willing to go to a studio, but we had to travel to each person individually to a studio near where they live and, and do the studio setup. And so for them, they had to decide they were willing to go to the studio. They felt comfortable in the studio. They felt comfortable with Claudia and our sound person and our assistant camera person. And so a lot had to come together. And then I think I'll toss it back to Shauna because once we actually got all this in place, you have no idea how many things went wrong because in production, you know, you plan for everything you can possibly plan for because you know that there's going to be things that go wrong that are completely out of your control. And on this project, the things that happened, we would have never imagined in our wildest dreams. And they've never happened to me before on any film ever. And I'm not sure, but Shauna and Sarah, I don't think you've ever had these things happen before either, right? And what makes it worse too is if you're there, there's a degree of which you can help. But if you're remote, I mean, we were still helping and fixing things, but it just takes that you're one layer removed. So it makes it a little bit, or it just took a little bit longer it's, it's sometimes. So, so Shauna, do you want to tell the story of what yeah, happened? You know, we were, were shooting uh, Amy Greenfield in uh, London and, you know, we, um, you know, uh, Sarah had found a studio that was, um, you know, fairly near her home and, um, and, you know, she kind of uh, approved the protocols uh, of how they were gonna, you know, handle the, uh, the COVID safe and, uh, and all, you know, was great. We spent a lot of time setting up and making sure that it was the same look we got in, in the States and she arrives and everything is set to go. And I would say, what, 15 minutes, a half an hour into the interview, we hear a scream, like a, a bloody murder scream. And it turns out that she had been stung by a bee that somehow a bee had gotten into the studio. And, uh, and the question was, was she allergic? 
And so when Sarah talks about you're that much removed, it's like, what do you do with a person that may just go into an allergic shock at this moment? But somehow um, she didn't um, and uh, was willing to kind of go ahead. I think we got, they got her an ice pack. She was willing to go, to go ahead with the shoot and we're going along <laughs> and about what? Another half hour later, there's another scream. And so she actually got stung twice. Uh, and yeah. it still insisted at that point, I think they wrapped her legs up in like velvet, you know, uh, a thick velvet fabric. And we went on and, and, and did the interviews. I mean, it, it was, that's what I, I meant when I said this film just really wanted to be made. People just really wanted to tell Elizabeth's story. Yeah. We owe Amy a big uh, debt of gratitude for continuing with the interview after being stung not once, but twice. She was, I think the word trooper is not enough of a superlative. She went yeah. above and beyond the call of duty. And, and you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know it to see her interview that she you know, had been stung by a bee. She had swollen ankles, she was in a bit of pain, but she, she really, uh, and it was a long interview because she really knows her life from, Elizabeth's life from start to finish. So she, she had, her endurance was spectacular. And a quick note to add on that, in the, the spirit of the film just really wanted to be made. I know I mentioned that working with you, we did, um, we worked remotely because of the pandemic, but something I glossed over was the fact that when we began working together remotely, it was, uh, my memory serves me shortly after things had shut down so the the Marshall Foundation the George T. Marshall Foundation was closed but Melissa went out of her way to bring the archives home and to keep going so that we could keep going with the project too so just another example of that there was a tremendous uh, force behind it that just it despite odds it wanted to get made. Let's talk a little bit about Elizabeth and about William um, and we know who from from the program that they started their code work together um, with Colonel George Fabian in Illinois at his Riverbank Laboratories. Um, can you give me give us some insight on on who George Fabian was and what his role was in in creating helping to create the Friedman story? Well, he's such a, you know, he's such a key part of the origin story and he's such a character. I mean, it's kind of in a longer film, I think we would have spent more time on Fabian um, because he is so unique to say the least. He's this wealth, wealthy industrialist, right? That um, now has a lot of money and free time on his hands. And he decides that he's going to create on his estate um, called Riverbank, some, I, I always describe it, it's some combination of think tank and commune uh, that it's, um, that he's gonna bring together some of the best scientific minds uh, to kind of live and most importantly work on the estate. So it's kind of this, uh, a state that's just brimming with scientific experiments, like all kinds of things from sound waves to genetics, uh, you know, it's just, it, it must have been just an incredibly uh, stimulating uh, place to be. And, you know, um, out of the blue when he brings Elizabeth there, I always think she must have thought that she had kind of just entered some sort of fairy tale, some weird surreal world, you know, because both of what it looked like because it was so kind of beautiful and bucolic and, and all these people just really engaged in what they were doing. Uh, Fabian was a complicated character because um, on the one hand, you know, um, he had this great interest in, in, in science and scientific progress. But on the other hand, he kind of ruled this uh, estate like the Lord of the Manor. Uh, uh, he, he, he needed to be the center of attention. Um, he, um, you know, he was, he could be quite stern 
uh, he could, um, you know, uh, he could uh, certainly let people know when they didn't please him. Uh, and he was, he was very domineering and he was very controlling. So he's a, he's, he's a complicated figure. He made everybody call him Colonel, even though that was kind of an honorary name. He had never been in the military. So the Colonel ruled Riverbank. So um, Elizabeth and William got involved in learning about codes and working with codes there. Um, and those, the involvement with code spilled over into their their personal life. Um, they married while they worked at Riverbank. Can you talk a little bit about how they used codes outside of work? Hillary, you wanna do that? Uh, one of the wonderful parts about um, Elizabeth and William's story is that when they fell in love with each other, they fell in love with code making and code breaking. And it wasn't just work for them. It was a lifelong passion and um, so in their early marriage years, uh, that when they moved to DC, after they left Riverbank, when they strike out on their own and, and William is working for the Army Signal Corps and Elizabeth has spent a little bit of time working there, but also has gone on to work for the Coast Guard and, and, and other, other places. Um, they have dinner parties. They're very social. They're, uh, you know, especially William was an extroverted, fun person, and they would have dinner parties that were progressive dinner parties. And in order to get your next, you know, course, you had to crack a code, which uh, I think some people loved and some people found terribly annoying. Um, but there was a lot of fun to it. When they sent out uh, holiday cards, uh, they would embed a code in the card. When they um, uh, had their, they had their own library and uh, they made special book plates that were um, comprised a Mayan code on their book book uh, book plate. So the love of cryptology infused everything they did, um, and including I know we'll probably get to this later a very famous photograph from World War One, which um, it has a secret code embedded in it, and then all the way through to the end of William's life with his gravestone. Uh, Elizabeth embedded a secret code. And then in a book they wrote together at the end of their lives about um, the, um, the, the myth of the Shakespeare cipher, um, they also embedded codes in that. So they never missed an opportunity to be playful and to embed a code. And in the course, there were years before William's work got super top secret leading up to World War I, where they could collaborate a little bit together, especially with Elizabeth's work for um, the Coast Guard in terms of uh, cracking the secret messages that run runners and bootleggers would send to each other. And sometimes the messages were not of the highest top secret nature. They were very mundane messages sent between a guy on a ship and a guy on land, like, you know, tell wife to send new glass eye, lost my eye, or, you know, um, funny little things like from land to a, to, a, to a guy on a ship saying, you know, you just had a baby or whatever, just these, these moments of life that, that they would decode and, and chuckle about together or sort of marvel at sort of the, 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 the messages that the panoply of messages that are out there because with, with everything that's secretive and, and um, changing the course of, you know, uh, a, a, you know a rum running, there's also just the, the minutia of daily life. Tell us about the knowledge is power picture. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to do that? Sure. Yeah. Um, that I love that image. Um, uh, so it's a panoramic photo that they, um, William and Elizabeth, were teaching um, code breaking classes um, to uh, other. Um, uh, soldiers within the army that would go out and use that um, code breaking knowledge in the field. Um, and so they get at the end of one of the sessions, they gathered the class and I believe it was outside of a hotel and um, you have a few lines of uh, soldiers that are all standing and I think one of our interview subjects. Um, I think it was Vince Houghton phrased it so well that when you're looking at the photograph if you initially look at it, you think oh whoever shot it wasn't very disciplined because you have people looking every which way no one's looking at a photographer they're just kind of looking around and you have half the people in the photo that are looking straight ahead and are looking at the camera. And then you have the other half of the people that have their head turned and it's not consistent. It could be to the left, to the right, it's just turned. And so that represents an A and B form. So the A is one way, B, or it might be vice versa. Um, 
uh, just speaking off the top of my head, but so you have your A and your B form and that makes up the foundation of the Baconian bilateral or bilateral, there's seen both ways that they're pronounced, um, cipher. And so within this photograph, this group panoramic photograph, you have an embedded code that reads knowledge is power. Um, and it, it's a fun, playful way, kind of like what Hillary was speaking to, of just the way that they really embodied code making and code breaking, and it, it, it seeped into all aspects of their life, but it's a, it's a, a beautiful photograph. Yeah. So it's a code that is, um, that is expressed in people. It's mm -hmm. not in letters in the alphabet, it's expressed in people. Uh, and it's, it's really quite, um, William, um, my understanding is that William kept that photograph, you know, with the, that key phrase of knowledge of his power, which I think was very meaningful to both him and Elizabeth. And William kept a photograph, I guess it was under glass in his desk uh, to the day he died. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, photograph, which was taken when, 1918? 17. 17. Yeah, and 17 I think so. or 18, um, just kind of he held on to forever. Right. And I think the most touching part of this, this photograph is that it represents this time where he and Elizabeth are working side by side, where they're making leaps and bounds in terms of their knowledge of code breaking. They're sort of developing a playbook for how to do this, and they're teaching the first dedicated unit of code breakers ever for the American military. So they feel like they're doing something big. And they're so inspired by this, this phrase, knowledge is power, which is uh, uh, Francis Bacon's motto. And, and so they embed it in this um, photo with people, a code in people to you know do Francis Bacon's motto in Bacon cipher. So it's just very clever. And the thing that's so lovely about it is that Elizabeth and William are introduced to each other and start working together on this project for George Fabian to see if Shakespeare wasn't written by Shakespeare, if it was really written by Francis Bacon, which was this prominent theory of the day that people as you know illustrious as Nathaniel Hawthorne and Mark Twain believed in. It wasn't just fringy kooks. And um, you know, it's all based on the theory that if you look at Francis Bacon's biliteral or bilateral cipher, that you'll discover these secret messages embedded in the early works of Shakespeare that says Bacon wrote Shakespeare. So they're, and they quickly realize because there's two such incredibly smart people that this is not something that can scientifically be proved with rigorous, you know, uh, scientific inquiry and it can't be, these results can't be independently repeated. You know, there's, this, this is very subjective and they realize very quickly that this theory is bunk. But this Francis Bacon cipher is what brought them together. And so they kind of infuse it with everything they do and carry it forward to the very end of their days, you know, through William's darkest days working on life and death matters in World War II, you know, till, till the end of their career where they go on to write a book debunking this myth once and, once and for all. It's their quest for knowledge, their love of knowledge, their love of truth, and their desire to sort of prove that things that are fake are fake. So, you know, this, this photo is sort of one of their tongue in cheek ways of expressing it, but it was something that they cared about deeply and held close to their sort of core beliefs. So um, tell me, what was the dynamic of William and Elizabeth's relationship? Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna talk about that since we're kind of at that, um, at that period. I mean, they meet in 1916. That's, you know, four years before women um, are granted the right to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and What's remarkable about them is that they really, at this you know very early moment in in kind of uh, uh, in time, have a relationship of equals. Um, they their relationship is is very romantic, but it's really the chemistry is also a very deep intellectual chemistry. Uh, they're just really excited by the way each other thinks and, um, and, and really uh, excited by working together. And it's really going to be the thing that characterizes their relationship for the rest of their lives. It is a marriage of equals. 
uh, and one in which they remain extremely devoted to each other uh, through lots of hardships. So when Elizabeth went to work um, breaking the codes during prohibition, um, why, why was that considered revolutionary at the time? Or even, you know, even now we look back on it as being a revolutionary period of time. Uh, uh, Hillary, you should answer that, but I, I, I should just say that, of course, when the Coast Guard approached Elizabeth, uh, they really wanted William. <laughs> that was a lot of what would happen is they, they really wanted William and William was unavailable. So they, they took what they thought was second best, which was Elizabeth. So um, she does agree to do this. And in the process just develops, I mean, she invents kind of a whole new approach to law enforcement. Say, so Hillary, do you wanna talk about that? Sure. Elizabeth really pioneers strategic intelligence. Um, and it's, it's amazing because when people think of her as a code breaker, they, they, you might think about someone who's in a room, you get a secret message and with your team, you crack that message and you get the plain text. But she did so much more than that. She's taking that information from that one uh, plain text and she's putting that next to all the other ones that she's you know, deciphered. And then she's thinking about, um, okay, these are smugglers. I've got the names of these ships all around the country going these places. They're going to these ports at this time and this date. And these are the captains. And these are the, um, the companies that we're dealing with because of course, prohibition, as we all know, is, you know, uh, booze is illegal in the United States, but it's legal everywhere else. So there are legal companies, these giant multinational corporations, some you can think as big as Walmart, who have these giant rum running syndicates and everything's legal until you hit American waters and American soil. So you've got these very complicated syndicates basically um, you know, going around you know, the coastal US and, and, um, and to Canada to the north and Mexico to the south. And she's putting together little bits and pieces of information from every source everywhere, East Coast, West Coast, Louisiana, Mexico, Panama, and she figures out who the main players are and how these syndicates are working and what's going to be delivered when and where. And she tells the Coast Guard, listen, you know, right now she's a one woman show. She's a woman and she's got a, basically a typist. And she's, you know, in the first three years, she decrypts a backload of basically three years worth of messages, something like 25,000 messages that they hadn't been able to read. And then she tells them, listen, I can do this for you all day. But I'm one person and you're always going to be behind the eight ball if you're just decoding messages. You've got to get uh, ahead of the game. And, and so she convinces them to hire a whole big team and she becomes the first cryptographer in chief, the first woman to lead a government um, cryptographic unit because she says we need a whole huge team because right now law enforcement, that's the Coast Guard, are patrolling 5,000 plus miles of coastline and it's a cat and mouse game and they're losing because the rum runners are always 10 steps ahead and the Coast Guard doesn't have that many boats and they can't be everywhere at once. But if we can understand the intentions and plans of these gangsters, then we can stop them before they act. We can get to the ships before they even unload them onto US soil or we can be there when they're unloading them. And so we like to call it our homeland map. Like we like to think of, you know, the map on the wall and she's got the, all the different players and all the different ships and all the different boats and you've got sort of a connect the dots thing. And so, and that is now known as strategic uh, intelligence. And she really pioneered that. And, um, you know, one of the experts- in our pioneering for different law enforcement entities to, to connect with each other and to talk with each other. Right. Um, and, and she's incorporating technology. She's working actually also with William, but with people at the Coast Guard to do, it's not GPS because it's a completely different technology, but it's a mobile, uh, mobile units that can pick up, they can put this unit on the back of a truck and they can pick up the signals from the um, bootleggers when they're sending messages. So she figures this first kind of, figures out this first kind of mobile unit to intercept the messages. So she's working on all ends and she's teaching agents around the country to 
crack codes and she's going to places where they've arrested, you know, some small potatoes in the syndicate and she's interviewing people and she's looking at the documents and she's putting together all the information um, so that she can actually, you know, she's more of an analyst and she's pioneering that kind of um, intelligence analysis that can create actionable plans. Um, and so when you look at what happened, for example, after 9-11, the way they get all the different law enforcement intelligence units together to have this kind of fusion center so that they can analyze all the information from all these threats and put it, you know, stop terrorist activities. That's what she's doing in the 1920s and 30s. And she basically pioneers it. And it's phenomenally successful. She makes um, rum running incredibly difficult for mobsters. And it's not just through cracking codes and pass, passing on plain text is through developing a whole strategic um, system where they can uh, beat them at their game and be everywhere before the bootleggers even know it. So it's quite remarkable. So it's almost really doesn't do her justice to just talk about her as a code breaker because her mind is so much more global and complex than that. Um, as difficult as it is to actually uh, you know, crack codes and God knows she's a marvel at that. But, um, but she really, um, her, she just got an extraordinary mind. Oh, you know, yeah. she, she was the only woman at the time working at the Coast Guard uh, when, when she was working the, the prohibition cases. So she really had um, pushed her way into um, more of a what might be considered a male dominated field. How did sexism play into her story? What did she push back with? Um, how did she she work um, during World War II with J. Edgar Hoover, who um, was was not, as we know, um, very forthcoming in where he got his intelligence? Well, I, I you know, when they leave Riverbank. Uh, and they move to DC, William has a job. I mean, she's really um, convinced that her career is over. And, and, and it's based on, uh, at a certain point, William enlisted to serve as a field code breaker in World War I. And of course, uh, that's something she really would have wanted to do as well. And, and certainly was equally, if not more skilled at uh, doing that, but women were not allowed to serve at the front, so she couldn't go. And so she thought, that's it, my, my career is over. And, you know, um, I gotta figure out what to do with this incredible intellectual mind of mine, but, you know, William is gonna be the one that has this career. And, and, and so that's truly what happens when they move to um, DC which is William is given a fairly important job. Uh, she's offered a job at half his salary and to work as his assistant. Um, so she does that for about a year and then uh, she quits and says, that's it, it's over. And it's only, uh, that's when she has her son and her daughter and it's only several years later that the Coast Guard is gonna approach her and picking up on, on uh, the moment where she's given her own unit um, by the Coast Guard, uh, once World War II, once the US enters uh, World War II, the Navy takes over the Coast Guard. And so they take over the, her unit and they, uh, they, uh, they essentially demote her and assign a young uh, code breaker um, who she had trained to be her boss, to be the head of the unit. Uh, because women were not allowed in the Navy to be in charge of men. So, uh, you know, whatever feelings she had about this, uh, she really makes the decision that um, her country needs her skills. 
and and uh, she keeps with it, and and does these um, this extraordinary work in World War II, which at a certain point um, J. Edgar Hoover enters the picture, and um, J. Edgar Hoover, who was so opposed to women. Um, kind of being part of the FBI. I think it, a woman was not allowed to join the FBI until 1973. Um, and uh, so it must have been kind of profoundly annoying to him that there is this woman that is doing this kind of extraordinary work in South America and breaking the codes of Nazi spy ring in South America. And um, and, and, and he takes certain actions that really get in her way. But ultimately, because of Elizabeth's work, um, you know, she completely breaks the Nazi spy ring, which is kind of this, I think, under untold or undertold story of World War II, how much South America could have become a third front in the war had it not been for Elizabeth's work. And um, J. Edgar Hoover completely takes credit for her work and completely buries her, uh, her role in it. He, he, he takes all of her decrypts and he changes their labels to FBI la labels. So essentially she's erased from history. Um, and that's um, and that's something that she has to watch and 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 accept and uh, believe there was nothing she could do anything about. Now, during World War II, do you know if Elizabeth and her group, um, her Coast Guard team, ever had any interactions or working with the Army at Arlington Hall or with the British at Bletchley Park? Uh, do you want to take that, Hillary? I mean, they, uh, well, for sure, Elizabeth uh, did work with people at Bletchley Park yeah. and they had the highest respect for her. And as a matter of fact, you know, before the US and British intelligence were so, um, had such a high level of cooperation, there were a lot of, there was a lot of work that was being done very separately and very independently. And so you have, everyone is very familiar with Enigma and all the work, the groundbreaking heroic work that's being done by Bletchley Park, especially to crack the German naval Enigma. These are, you know, codes that are changed every day and they, they use the bomb, those early electromagnetic machines to, to crack these codes that are changing, you know, at midnight every night. Um, and it's highly complicated and, uh, what people might not be aware of is that there were other kinds of Enigma machines, maybe with fewer rotors, a little bit slightly less complicated, but ultimately the same. And that uh, the German um, uh, spy networks were using them, German diplomats were using them. And so when Elizabeth is trying to crack these codes in South America, you know, that the South American spy rings are sending uh, back, they're sending messages back to Berlin, back to, Hamburg about, you know, American ships and these ships are carrying troops and supplies, things that are crucial to the war effort. You can't win the war without troops and supplies. Um, very urgent things. Um, at one point, they're sending these messages on Enigma machines. And um, the big difference is, is that they're not changing the keys, the codes to, to, to um, for Berlin and, and Hamburg to decrypt these messages. They don't change them every day. And, and the spies are careless and they make a lot of effort, but they're still Enigma machines. They're still incredibly complicated. And Elizabeth's genius is that using no computers, you know, pen and paper and her team of code breakers, they, they, they crack these messages and they do it right at the same time that folks are working on similar messages from, from spies in, in, in England at, the, at Bletchley Park. And so they were in awe of her. They had bigger teams and, and more resources. And here's this woman doing the same thing. So afterwards, there were a lot of ways that they worked together um, and, and supported each other. And one thing that is um, so poignant from this time, which really speaks to the sexism, is Elizabeth's in a very high level meeting with counterparts from the UK. 
and there are notes taken from the meeting. And one of the most basic things is just an attendance sheet of who's there. And, uh, you know, her name is Mrs. Friedman. And afterwards, someone goes through and they take white out and they cross out the S because someone's like, oh, that must have been a typo that they're misses, it had to be Mr. Friedman. And, and that's how she's written out of history of being at this very important meeting of sort of the biggest players in US and British intelligence. And so there was nothing nefarious done. It was just that sort of, se that sort of those sexist assumptions that underlay you know, all of American society. And, and, and that kind of thing happened to her every day, all the time. Um, and, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to segue to that, but one of my favorite stories of how she sort of confronts the sexism is during Prohibition when, she, when she's testifying at uh, the Conexco trial against the Consolidated Edison Company, which we like to call, you know, the Walmart of, you know, rum runners. Um, and so I don't know if someone else wants to tell the story, but she really, she's at the top of her game there. She is responsible for making this case possible. She's been called in to testify. She's risked her life because at the time, you know, when mobsters were put on trial, a lot of times the uh, attorneys for the defense, when a witness is called to the stand, they wouldn't even ask any questions because that, that wasn't their point. They're not trying to prove their case. They just want to get their eyes on the, 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 the witness so they can put a hit out on them. So the, the risk to her life was huge. And she takes a great risk because she knows how important this case is. You know, organized crime is terribly violent. People often forget that sort of the underbelly of prohibition was the rise in organized violent crime. Um, and so she goes to the, the stand to, to testify. And again, she faces enormous sexism, but I, I should toss it to Sarah or Shauna to, to tell the story of her at the trial because it's one of my favorite moments from the film. Sarah, you want to take it? Sure, yeah. She she shuts down the lawyers who are just really trying to um, discredit her, not give her her due, or not being very respectful. Um, they're jumping all over her, and they think they can walk all over her um, and just move on on with the their case. Um, but she doesn't. She doesn't suffer fools gladly at all, and she she doesn't she doesn't stand for it. And so she takes control of the questioning, and she. Um, she asked the judge for a blackboard um, to show, to demonstrate why, why her systems are correct, why they're foolproof and why they're just trying to say, oh, she's just claiming this is so, but she lays out step by step. And by the end of her testimony, there's no further questions and she just seals the case. And it's with her testimony that really brings the, the verdict, um, uh, the guilty verdict for uh, the mobsters that um, they're trying. Um, and uh, again, with the, the press coverage, um, she again faces sexism because some, some of the news reports do do a good job and she's thankful for those. And um, uh, they cover the, the case fairly, but uh, the bulk of it is through a very sexist lens. They call her the pretty little woman. Um, they talk about her appearance um, and she's disheartened by that. And I think a combination of that and also just the nature of her um, her profession, um, you can't really have, you know, she's a very secretive line of work. You can't have all of this out in the media. After a while, she really comes to have this um, aversion to the press. Um, and she does talk about, I think there was Margaret uh, Sangri, I'm sure I'm, I'm mispronouncing the last name, um, did an interview with her. I wanna say it was NBC, but there was a, it was a female reporter and she spoke about, you know, how much she appreciated that interview. Um, that was a really fair one. So there are select ones that she she really did like the coverage and appreciated the 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 um, the, the notice and uh, words slip in my mind. But um, um, she she appreciated their their honor. But yeah, the the other. So, uh, so the, the only little addition to that is that the uh, the. I guess it's defense lawyers. Um, some of the people being prosecuted were involved with Al Capone's gang, you know, the most no notorious gangster in the country at the time. And the lawyers were Al Capone's lawyers. So she's going up against, you know, kind of the most ruthless, you know, um, uh, attorneys who really are trying to dismiss code breaking as witchcraft. 
is what they call it. So um, as, as Sarah was saying, she does an, um, you know, when, when she brings out that, that uh, blackboard and starts giving a lesson in code breaking, I mean, it's kind of like, you can hear an audible gasp uh, in uh, the audience for, for what she's able to do. Just wanted to, for one second, to go back to Bletchley, which is that for, you know, the Europeans had always valued code breaking a lot more than the Americans and always put a lot more resources to code breaking. So in Bletchley, you have, you know, a, a campus there with thousands of people working. And um, as Hillary mentioned, they're really kind of at the forefront of developing what you know we would consider early computers in order to help them in their code breaking. So it doesn't, uh, you know, what they did was amazing, but by contrast, what Elizabeth did was um, equally as amazing because she's still working in a small unit and and still working with pencil and paper. So um, it's, uh, you know, I mean, that's going to quickly change after uh, World War II. What would you all say are some of Elizabeth's greatest accomplishments? Elizabeth, and, um, and there are times where it's hard to talk about Elizabeth without talking about Elizabeth and William. Uh, because really what they did was they invented a new science uh, of code breaking or certainly modern code breaking. And, you know, that's, that's a legacy that we benefit from, you know, to this very moment. What do you think guys, would you agree? Absolutely. And, you know, one of our interviewees, Barbara Osteka, who um, had been an intelligent analyst, um, she told me that when she first started her training, the methods and techniques that she learned all go back to William and Elizabeth and those early methods that they developed. So although it's become, you know, from there, it's launched into this giant world of cartography that's that's very complicated, but the, the origins still have their fingerprints all over it. Um, and, and that's something that uh, very much shaped intelligence, you know, for the next century. And so very much so, you know, William is often called, you know, the father of the NSA, but, uh, but Elizabeth herself, you know, has a role as sort of, uh, you know, the mother of modern cryptography, you know, in America. And, and without the pair of them working during World War I to develop these new methods to decrypt, decrypt these codes for the US military um, and the, the War Department, the Army, the Navy, the State Department, without them working side by side, developing these new methods, pushing the boundaries of the science and then codifying it and making it replicatable and, 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 um, and also teachable and then training the first, you know, dedicated group of code breakers in America, that, that changed everything because prior to that, the US military did not have a dedicated code breaking unit. And this is before the FBI and the CIA and the NSA. And in peacetime, the US had no intelligence unit. That was considered, as Shauna was saying, dirty business. You know, we don't spy on our friends and we definitely don't spy on our enemies during peacetime and, and during wartime, we only spy on our enemies. And so the US had no intelligence apparatus and they're very much fundamental to the development of that. Um, and she deserves her place alongside William for the development. And I would say that the thing that I find remarkable is that even as people are giving Elizabeth her due, there's still often this sexism that's tinged with it because they often talk about William as being the mathematical genius, you know, and he was, and he, he was instrumental in so many crucial breakthroughs in, in World War II. Um, but they describe Elizabeth as being intuitive and it almost sounds like women's intuition when in fact, intuition is something that's based on years of skills and experience. And by World War II, Elizabeth had cracked 
thousands and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of codes for decades. She'd seen every kind of um, encryption machine, you know, from, you know, Enigmas to Kyrgyz to this and that. She knew every kind of code. She knew so much about the history of code making and code breaking, and she had experience doing everything. And that is what enabled her to make these breakthroughs. And that's where her, in, her intuition came from, skills and experience. And so I find that often this, 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 this um, reliance on, you know, what was her special skill intuition, I find it very, very dismissive and um, not really, um, I, she doesn't get her full due. I think also, uh, you know, kind of on a on a human you know personal level that there is no question that both of them could have and especially William um, made so much more money going into the private sector that they decided to really keep working for the government and to keep doing this you know to to help keep the country safe uh, is something that they did, not that they didn't have a comfortable life, but it was a life where, you know, when the roof needed to be repaired, um, it was a concern. Um, so uh, I, I think they embody a certain kind of a, uh, a, a patriotism and a commitment to serving their country that kind of underlies all that we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think I would just add, you know, one of my favorite things about Elizabeth that I think is a theme that runs through her whole life is that she was a risk taker. And even before you get to, you know, um, World War, you know, the Prohibition era with the with the taking on, you know, the mob and Al Capone's associates and, and rum runners and, and World War Two with, you know, um, uh, fighting Nazi spies in South America as a as a code breaker. Um, she from the very get go challenges assumptions about who she's supposed to be and what she's supposed to be. This is a woman born in 1892 who's expected to grow up, get married, work on the farm. And she fights tooth and nail to be able to go to college. And in the end convinces her father to let her go and pay for it. But she has to take on the burden of paying him back with 6% interest. And she, she does that. And even though she wants to study and spend all her time studying college, she takes on work as a seamstress and doing women's hair and other things so that she can pay for that. And then after school, when she does you know, fall into the work that is really the only one of the very few options for educated women at the time, go, go and teach school. And she does that, but she hates it. And again, she takes a huge risk. She goes to Chicago. She has very little money. She, she puts herself up in a, in a hotel, like a rooming house, and she goes looking for work of, you know, the research intellectual capacity of which she finds none. She's a massive failure. She has to go home and she's been a complete failure. And instead on her last day, instead of taking a sightseeing tour, she goes to pursue something that's so meaningful to her. She goes to the Newberry Library to see Shakespeare's first polio because she loves Shakespeare and she's so excited to see the real McCoy. And that's where she meets a librarian who tells her about George Fabian, who's looking for someone to do some kind of research on a project by Shakespeare. So in every sense of the world, she sort of, where she takes control of her fate, she takes a risk. And even there, she takes a risk to go with this strange man to his estate and find out what this job is all about. That was very bold for a woman of her time to go unchaperoned with a, a strange gentleman to his estate, you know, uh, a train ride away. Um, and then when she gets there, you know, she jumps right into this new line of work. So I'm always sort of taking my hat off to her that all these crucial moments in her life, she sort of, you know, looks at her options and says, you know, I want to pursue a life of the mind. I want to do this kind of intellectual work. I have more in me than, you know, I'm not content to uh, get married and raise a family or to, to spend my life as a teacher, all wonderful things, but she has a yearning for more. She, you know, has a, 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 a brilliant mind that she wants to put to use and she makes it possible. So that's really one of my favorite things about her, that she was such a risk taker.
one of our favorite conversations that we would always have amongst ourselves is, is what do we admire about Elizabeth? So, um, so Sarah, what did you admire most about Elizabeth? Oh, I think it was a little bit of just her steadfastness that, and as you guys were talking um, of just how um, dedicated she was, I, I was thinking back, it's really, I think we think now too, it's it's wonderful going back and honoring these women and looking at the work she did. And I think there's a lot um, being said now of kind of the importance of representation. If you see it, you can be it. Um, but I was thinking about her and thinking about who her role models would have been and was just kind of thinking in awe of her of maybe she didn't have as many role models as we have today, but that didn't stop her sight of what she thought was possible for herself. And she um, really strove to do what she wanted and she didn't let not seeing an example of someone do it before her stand in her way. So um, I just really admire her. And then as a, a sidebar, a interesting part of this project, and I think I will always admire Elizabeth is um, just her talent for code breaking. Um, I hope I'm not speaking for anyone, but I don't think any of us are experts on code breaking and weren't before this, but had to learn, of course, a bit to do the project. But just the more we would try to get into the details of code breaking to understand what she and Elizabeth or she and William were working on, the more we were just in awe of their accomplishments. Um, they, they were just phenomenal people and really developed. Um, they, they, they didn't have formal training. They really figured this out and pioneered it. And it's um, the further we go into it, the more in awe I am of, of both of them and really Elizabeth, yeah. And, and thank goodness we had Sarah on the team because I don't get code breaking at all. <laughs> so, and, and Hillary, Hillary does too. much better We're than I do. <laughs> Sarah. Um, before we end, I'd like to know about some of your favorites. Sarah, I know you worked a lot with the photos. Did you have a favorite photo among the hundreds that I'm sure you worked with? Oh yeah, that was a joy, just getting to go through all their photos. You feel like you get to know them really well. Um, I, of course, the, um, of course, the panoramic photo of the soldiers, but there's one photo of her that stands out and it didn't make it into the film, but it's this photo of Elizabeth when she's a little bit older. Um, it's a close up photo and she's smiling and turning and looking at the camera and it's there's a lot of photos of her looking quite serious and working, but this photo to me, just going, being able to go through the span of their time from Riverbank when she's very young to she and William together um, when they're older and, and towards the end of their lives. This photo to me just holds that it's the same spirit you see in her from those early photos when she's in her young twenties, or even I think there's some high school photos. You just see this energy and spirit in her. And I think it's beautiful that it's this photo. I'm going to guess she might be in her fifties or sixties, but it's just brimming with this energy. And I, it's just such a lovely image. So I think a lot of times when I think of Elizabeth, that, that photo is in my head. Now, yeah, is, there, you guys. is there anything that you all really, um, would love to have included, but were unable to put into the program as it ended up on PBS. Is there anything that you had to leave out that you're sorry you had to leave out? Oh, a lot. Her a story lot. Was rich. Yeah, you guys go for it. Well, you know, I think that um, it, it, what Hillary was talking about earlier, it's the fun, playful aspects of who she is and who they were that was very kind of sad to me uh, to leave out. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, had, uh, had we had a little bit more time in the film, it might've been good to delve a little bit more into William's uh, accomplishments. Um, this was Elizabeth's story and it should have been Elizabeth's story. So, you know, it's, it's a very careful line, um, the balance between her and William, but it, it, it might have been, it might have been, you know, just kind of uh, enrich the story with uh, knowing a little bit more about William. Um, what do you... I would also add that we talked about it today, but it's not in the film, which is after World War II, when yeah. Elizabeth and William are able to finally work together again, they work on the book debunking the, the theory of Bacon authorship of, of Shakespeare. That's not in the film. And to me, you know, there's only so much you can put in an hour film. So, so these are choices that you have to make, but it was such a poignant moment in the story that the things that 
drew them together at the beginning of their lives. They come to work um, full circle at the end of their lives. And especially because, you know, the man that brought them together, George Fabian, was such a force for good and bad. Um, he introduced them to code breaking. He introduced them to Francis Bacon and the bi biliteral cipher. He had a world-class library unparalleled in the United States with uh, books about code breaking, you know, a very a full of rare European, you know, books that you could get nowhere else. So, so much that is foundational to their story and their lives and their work came from him. And, and then at the end of their lives, you know, they return back to this and it's sort of like the thing that was bunk you know is is brought them together for the great love story of their lives and the, and this great professional journey of their lives and and so i thought it would have been poignant to sort of be able to to put that at the end of the story but there's only so many storylines and only so many stories you can you can put in a film and and so um you can't do everything that's the difference between books and films so um that would have been something that would be would have been nice to include. And the other thing that we really couldn't include in the film because we did not have time, but, and it's one of the playful things that we mentioned, but Elizabeth put a secret code on William's headstone and nobody noticed it for years until this woman um, said, William and Elizabeth put codes in anything. There must be a code. And she went to the gravesite and she looked at it and she figured out that it was done in, you know, Baconian, by literal cipher and then she went to the archives and she saw Elizabeth's handwritten note to the tombstone engraver with the decoding of it and with the, with the instructions for how to do it and with the with the cipher text and the plain text and I mean what could be more fitting than you know Elizabeth putting um uh, what did it say Hillary what what did it say uh it, it said WFF it was William's initials and so I, I, I love that. And those little notes just add so much flavor, but there's only like, you know, there's only so much time in the film. So there's, there, every film has many stories that you, that you can't include, um, uh, you know, but um, this one, I think in particular, her life was so rich, her life was so full. She worked, you know, from um, beginning to end. And I, and I think there were more elements also of her personal story we would have liked to include. Um, you know, she, she, um, she is a fascinating, you know, person professionally and personally. And um, it really was a pleasure to work on her story. Yeah. And we were lucky to have, uh, you know, the George C. Marshall Foundation Library and the work of these amazing authors, you know, Jason Fagoni in particular, but also um, uh, G. Stuart Smith, who uh, is Elizabeth's great nephew, who wrote a book about her, um, A Life in Code, that is a phenomenal book. And, and then these other scholars like Amy Butler Greenfield, who's working on a, a book right now um, as well about Elizabeth. And um, that was wonderful. But the, but the the Marshall Library in in some ways was key because I I remember when uh, we first started working on this we had no idea for all we knew there were two photographs of Elizabeth and that was it and somehow we were going to make a film out of this so that when we stumbled on the Marshall Library it really was like you know mana from heaven. And, and it was so well um, uh, cataloged. It was so easily accessible. I remember my first day of going online and looking at all, you know, 500 photographs, you know, and just, you know, thinking, oh my God, what a gift, what a gift. And, and, um, and I think it was that day of looking through all the photographs um, that I really were, I, I really felt like I was able to take them in as people because that's what those photographs do. And of course, you know, especially Hillary went through a lot of the audio recordings and, you know, uh, all the other things there too, but those um, those photographs were just amazing. So, so what what do you think that we can do to help um, 
keep and share Elizabeth's memory? Uh, that's, you know, I just think that, you know, kind of the more people know about her, uh, I think, I think it will, a momentum will build. Um, the more people know about her, the more people will want to know about her. Um, so I, I, I'm very, um, I, I feel very optimistic about that. I mean, kind of the last line of the film um, is, you know, well, if we missed a story as big as Elizabeth's, uh, you know, two world wars, um, then who else are we missing? And, and I, I think that that's something we, you know, is a really a lesson learned uh, from, from kind of the, bringing her story to light out of the darkness into the light. Well, I certainly appreciate uh, you very much uh, coming in and speaking with us tonight and sharing what you learned um, and how you created this, this lovely film. If people didn't get a chance to see it when it was on PBS in January, um, it is available streaming on the American Experience website. And I truly encourage you to go and, and watch and listen and learn. Thank you so much for being with us tonight um, and have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you for making all the material available. We could not have made the film without your support and help. So thank you and your marvelous, amazing collection. Thank you.